yeah, you have to really think it through. You have to imagine that you're actually going to conduct this study. I mean, that's the perspective you have to have. And so what are all the things you'd have to think about, you know? Yeah, I think I reviewed the material like four times. <laughs> well, we're going to, I'm going to anyhow cop, uh, talk about yours just because you're here. Nine one four. Someone teaches in here and um, they don't use a whiteboard on their computer. Instead, they use this whiteboard and turn the, the wow. screen to film it. <laughs> it's interesting. So I thought I'd do that first one. I don't like to make it a little better. You know, I didn't even notice that we're using the whiteboard. Yeah, but that's how someone, yeah, they always have that flipped around. I did a research on hydration over the summer. Yeah. And the people I did it for the quiz that you know man. Cool. What do you mean you did research on that over the summer? Like, um, just like a survey, almost like a survey and research on hydration. And <sighs> this screen is messed up. So you were saying you did this survey research, and so now someone's presenting your work? Probably not mine, but um, it's cool that they're presenting something similar. Yeah. So what you find out, that people don't drink enough water? That and it kind of like just your whole body kind of basically runs off water. And it's just like kind of advocating for people to drink more water. Yeah. And then like a survey of some of their preferred beverages. Yeah. And like a lot of people put like soda as their first drink of the day. Oh no. Oh my goodness. <laughs> or like energy drinks and then like other drinks. And yeah. Coffee. Some people actually start their day with water. <laughs> my daughter told me a while back like that she started, she had this big mason jar, you know, the big cord mason jars by her bed. This is when she was pregnant. And she said in the morning she just drinks it. Fairly, you know, quickly mm -hmm. until it's gone, like within the first hour of getting up. And she says, it just makes you feel so incredibly good all day. Mm -hmm. And I still wake up that way, not a whole mason jar, but first thing I do in the morning is like drink a big glass of water. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, other things like even this tea mm -hmm. tends to dehydrate. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. I really wanted some people to come. People are struggling a little. I thought this would help. I think Richard said he was going to come. Let's see what we can do. So for the future, I think of offering this class in person or just kind of stay online. I want to do it in person. What I have for next term is that we're going to meet the president suggested going um, really different schedule so that people who work can come, like going Saturdays. So I scheduled this class for like just three Saturdays, but meeting all day. And then students will do work in between. But like we would meet the first week of class and I'd go over all the basics and like what is science and I could show people like the technology things that they need to know and give an overview of how to approach, you know, and then we'll meet again at the midterm, is what it's scheduled for. And then we'll meet again at the final. Mm -hmm. So three Saturdays all day. All but day, wow. Eight to four. But we won't really start at eight because that's not my thing. Mm -hmm. So we'd probably go like nine, you know. And that's where this class research method? Yeah, and we make it sort of like a potluck. We kind of bring like 
we'd bring some foods for lunch and then, you know, people could go for a walk after lunch because I would love to, but, you know, we would kind of approach it that way, maybe get some coherence. Guess how many people are signed up for us so far? 13. Zero. Oh, my God. No one's going to take it. I think it's because they don't understand. They think it's every Saturday, but it's just these three Saturdays, but it looks in the catalog like it's every Saturday, so... I've been trying to tell advisors. But well, you told me to guess. You made it sound like there was a lot of people that signed up. Their no, people just want to stay home anymore, I think. <laughs> you know, there's a push to put this whole psych program online, but I'll tell you one thing. My own, like, feeling of wanting to continue teaching rests almost completely on being with students in a classroom. And not, you know, it's awkward for a student to be alone in a classroom. You know, you need more students. You need bodies together. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, I'll keep doing it, but I don't feel like I'm gonna feel much, you know, you can't get into heart space when you're online. That's that's what there is to it, I think. The Zoom classes are pretty cool too. Yeah, I mean, maybe. I, I find it still is not, quite the same for reasons like this right now. We're sitting here before class chatting and on Zoom, you don't see faces, people blank out their faces. If the meeting hasn't started, everyone's just quiet mm -hmm. or like talking during breaks or after class or just catching verbal expressions or body language, just miss up a bunch of cues, I think, when you're on Zoom. So it's not my favorite modality. Yeah. And plus so often, you know, you ask a question and person you ask isn't even there. They're like gone. They have their camera off. But, you know, the distractions are so easy to have. And so. Or they're on Zoom, but they're not really on Zoom. They're not on Zoom, you know. And I myself, when I attend meetings on Zoom, you know what? I always have something going on my second screen. Always. Like, it's super hard not to because there's so much work to do. So I don't blame students. Mm -hmm. I mean, I understand it, but it doesn't make for the best learning. You just sit down in the room. You have to really dive in. So I think it's the wave of the future, though, and I'm going to be... Oh, Dustin's on. Oh, yay, Dustin made it. You got a cool picture. Yeah, it is a good picture. Dustin, hey, glad you made it. Dustin, glad you made it. You here? Do you know that song, an old song? It's by, I think it's by Pink Floyd, maybe, and it goes, Hello, hello, hello. Is there anybody out there? <laughs> Just not if you can <laughs> hear me. <laughs> Is there anyone else? Yeah, that's what I feel like on Zoom sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good word. Yeah. But I saw your thumb, Dustin. I'm glad you made it. Um, so what I wanted to meet with, what I thought might be helpful, is if I could go through some of what I comments I made to um, some students, like some advice and talk to you about why that is, and then especially look forward to what's coming up in the results and discussion section. So that's where we're at today, and I'll give it maybe just two more minutes because Richard said he was coming too. We'll see if he can pop in here, and if not, then we'll just get started, and I can answer your questions. We'll start maybe with your questions, and then I'll go into what I was hoping to share with you today. Am I on mute? No. It comes out through here. You can, uh, Dustin can hear me. But we won't be able to get the view that I want when I share the screen. We're not going to be able to see Dustin anymore because something's wrong with this system. And I need to report it. Someone came out to try and help last Thursday and couldn't get it fixed either. So, okay, well, I want to start 
um, by first off ask and saying what questions that you have. So, um, you know, I gave you guys a lot of feedback, for better or worse. I kind of want to go over why I did that today. And anything that I can answer that you want to have addressed right away before we get any further? Well, I'll tell you what I am encouraging for every single student. Hello. Are you Richard? Yes. Wow, I thought I recognized you. <laughs> Sometimes I don't make the connection. Yeah. So nice to see you. We have yep. cookies here. It's nice and, to finally meet you. <laughs> yeah, likewise. And some tea here as well. So if you like tea. Oh, I'm good. Thank you. Okay, we'll have a cookie anyhow at some point. Um, yeah, I'm super glad you made it. So, um, Richard, this is Gabriel. How's it going? He's, uh, and then we have Dustin here online. I don't know if anyone else is going to make it. So, where are the outlets? People often have to sit over there, see so where yeah. that desk is. Yeah. I, I bring, oh yeah, I bring a long extension cord every single day. Outlets just like sprouting out of tables in this future world we're all living in. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of wonder sometimes if every generation that lives thinks that, <laughs> thinks that they're living at a time of major societal change. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, because it feels right really major to me. And yet, I suppose they felt that way, you know, 100 years ago, 50 years ago, <laughs> all along. Okay, well, congratulations to all, to all three of you who are here, because I can speak that all three of you have been persistent in this material that is tough and challenging when you haven't had it before. It's a new way of thinking that in many ways is contrary to another way of thinking, because it involves linear like does A cause B, straight lines, and straight lines don't much exist in reality. So congratulations. I mean, you guys are awesome. And that's all I can say. And persistent and staying with it and doing your best to learn. And so I'm just, I feel very pleased and honored to be here with all of you. So, oh, I shared my wrong screen. So let me get my other screen shared instead of this one. And I started a minute ago by saying, I'd like to begin by answering your questions. And I'm gonna just repeat that since you've now arrived, Richard. Are there any questions that you wanna start with right off the bat before we get into more serious content? Or Dustin? Okay. So, oh, I see the screen sharing first. Okay, so um, you'll notice if you had some your results that I encourage you to design. And that is because you're getting a lot of classes, several classes in research that isn't experimental. The kind of thing with surveys and interviews, like what you did, descriptive research. And it is research, but it's really important to learn this piece that is inferential. And let me tell you why. So when I was putting together a proposal for a grant related to this addiction licensure, I know that the people who have the money, the National Institute of Health, and I know that all of the organizations at the federal level, what they want to see isn't descriptive research because descriptive research can't much be generalized. What they want to see is something called, they call this the gold standard, And it is what's called a randomized controlled trial. So, for example, if there's a new drug, the abbreviation RCT is common. If there's a new drug that comes out and the pharmacists want to start selling this drug to treat some condition, they don't want the pharmacist to just take a group of people. So here are some people with a condition. Let's um, call the condition, um, what's a good name for a, con a condition? 
Philanophobia, people who are afraid of cats, totally made up, okay? But let's imagine that this is a serious condition and the scientists think they have a medication for it. And so if we take a bunch of people with philanophobia and we give them the medication and then we, so we test before, we test their levels of philanophobia, we give them the medication and then we test again. And we hope to see that philanophobia went up, right? This is a standard quasi-experimental design. It's quasi-experimental because what else could have caused the decline in philanophobia, fear of cats, over this time period? So maybe during this same time period, um, there was a great movie that came out about a cat, you know, right? And all these people who had philanophobia, they, many of them saw the movie and cats took on great favor and love. Maybe that caused the change. Or maybe just taking the medicine caused the change, right? Maybe even the medicine didn't work, but the fact that they were giving medicine, like if you took, like if someone gave you an aspirin for a headache, and you're like, oh, thank goodness, and you took it, and then your headache decreased. And then later they told you, oh, that wasn't real medicine. <laughs> and you say, no, 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 it worked. Why would it work? You believed it worked? You believed it would work, right? Maybe your anxiety reduced, so your headache reduced. That's the placebo effect. So we have to rule those effects out. We're trying to say medicine causes improvement. But if we have all kinds of other possible explanations for the improvement, we don't have a strong study. So a randomized controlled trial says, well, let's take our people with philanophobia. Let's assign some to get the medicine. Let's assign others to get a placebo. And then let's measure philanophobia again. And if some of them, if they all show improvement, the ones who got the medicine and the ones who got the placebo, what do we conclude about our medicine? <laughs> so this group, so let's just look at this here. This group got the medicine. And this group got the fake medicine, the placebo. And let's say they're, let's measure philanophobia symptoms. And let's say this is the before. That's how severe the philanophobia was in the medicine group. And this is the after. We have an improvement, right? Fewer symptoms. And in this group, we have results that are very similar. That's how many symptoms they had before. And after the treatment, that's how many they have after. the same results in both conditions. Both groups improved. So does the medicine work? Yeah, I might try. <laughs> if this medicine worked, we would have expected to see something like this. We would expect to see a reduction in symptoms for the medicine group and no change for the placebo group, right? Mm -hmm. Then we know the medicine works. If they both changed, it's not the medicine causing the change, is it? It's taking a pill that's causing the change. So maybe it's like, finally, a doctor's taking me seriously, right? Mm -hmm. And their symptoms improve because someone gives them attention, right? So. This is why we do random control trials, the RCT. I mean, this is the only thing that's going to get you money. So if you seriously have something you want to study, you're studying um, proximity to casinos, I think, right, Richard? Yeah. And Gabriel's studying the effects of exercise on well-being or something along those lines. Dustin is studying um, uh, plants. That do live plants in the home cause people to have lower stress levels? These are good questions, guys. And just, you see, I can't remember quite your study right now. But we'll, we'll talk about all of these. So in your papers, um, the ones that I saw so far, we're all doing this kind of pre-post design. So you're choosing one sample. 
So Gabriel, I already told you I was going to use yours as the example here. So you're taking one sample, whoever you chose. In Gabriel's case, it's college students. You're measuring some variables. So you're going to measure well-being and heart rate, I think. All right. So you're going to get a measurement here at stage one. Then you're going to take those same people and you have them exercise for 30 minutes a day for a certain period of time. And then during or after at stage two, you're going to measure again. So now let's say, let's make this real. And I want everyone to get some critical thinking here. Let's imagine that this is real. Let's just write measure. Hypothesis, how would you state your hypothesis in really simple words, kind of like we did in stats class, Gabriel? Could you, so I can write it down? Your research hypothesis? People who exercise. Exercise. Will have lower, will have higher. Higher. See if I can get it to write better. We have higher what? Heard I use with self esteem or motivation? Then those would higher be. Higher self esteem than those who don't exercise. And you really, I think, wisely chose a pre-post exam. So this is a pre-post. We're getting the pre-measure. Now we're getting a post-measure. And so you would conclude, based on this, that if you see an improvement in self-esteem, that you want to say that exercise causes the impact in self-esteem, right? So now let's be really critical thinkers here. So let's imagine you actually did this and you did it in, start, let's say next semester, you start in January. And you conclude, let's say May, you wanna do it the whole semester, you conclude in May. Now, is there anything else that could happen between January and May that could cause people's self-esteem to change? especially we're working with students. Can you think of anything systematically that would happen for most of these people? Midterms. Okay, or exams. So, um, my screen is being wonky here. So sometimes experiences during the semester cause change in well-being, cause change in mood, cause change in motivation. So just the rhythm of the semester, we have the start of the semester, end of the semester. So let's just write our semester changes. Now my thing's shut down here. See if it's still there. back there, um, but let's just put this back to pre. And we're gonna measure well-being or self-esteem, something like that. And then we're gonna measure it again after. And what we're looking for is to show that there's a direct line, a direct connection between the exercise and the outcome. And then we were at the point of saying, what else could cause this outcome? So we measure self-esteem, well-being, how good people feel. We measure it in January. And then we go along, right? We don't do anything. There's no exercise. We just go along. And then we measure those same things again. 
self-esteem and well-being. So is there anything that could happen in the middle here that could <coughs> cause changes in well-being just naturally? And someone suggested the semester rhythm, right? Just like, you know, you do well in the semester, right? Or you're just done with the semester and you're just relieved so you're feeling good, okay? Anything else? The rhythm of the semester could cause changes. We're going from January to May. What else happens between January and May? Can you think of anything else that might cause people to have differences in their sense of well-being, motivation to exercise? Weather the weather. Yeah, the, uh, as I say, seasonal depression. <laughs> ah, the sun. I mean, I totally relate to that, having lived in North Dakota. The sun changes, the temperatures. I mean, there's a lot. Of the daylight. <laughs> okay. So now imagine yourself, the presenter. Anything else you can think of that I haven't thought of anymore, but maybe you guys do? Like an accident. Okay. So there are individual things that could happen to personal things. But those probably wouldn't happen to the whole group. So maybe, you know. There are some other things that could happen to the cohort. I mean, if global warming gets really bad or the world breaks into war, I mean, those could happen too, right? I mean, that's not that far off these days, right? So now we've just acknowledged that we have interfered with this line. We have put question marks on the relationship between exercise and self-esteem, right? Why? Because this is a possible explanation, this is a possible explanation, and there are others. That's why we do randomized control trials. We want to rule as many of these out as possible. So that would be like a variable. All of these are variables, and all of these are extraneous variables. Remember this from earlier? Extraneous variables. Variables that could affect the outcome. So these other passage of time kind of variables are possible problems. Then there may be others. So what we do for a randomized control trial is we don't take just one sample. We use two samples. One is our condition of interest. So we randomly assign some people to this, um, let's call it uh, condition one, which is the exercise condition. So some people are randomly assigned there, but we also assign some people to condition two, which is some sort of a comparison condition. So how are we going to make this work? So condition two could be just a control group, another group of people that you just get a pre-measure and a post-measure and you don't do anything in between. That would be that non-equivalent control, right? So that's a possibility. It is a non, it's right, possibility one. Non-equivalent control. So is that like checking up on them or not even checking up on them the whole time or? For Gabe's measure, you mean? Yeah. So he's got his own design. How often were you going to check up on their measures? Was it just before and after, or were you getting like weekly measures, Gabe? I can't remember. It was weekly and monthly measures. And okay. then at the very end. Okay, so you were going to get them all along the way. So that's a complex analysis statistically, but we can do it. Um, it's called a time series analysis. But, um, you know, you could take like the mean for the first week, the mean for the second week, and I don't know if you're expecting like a continuous improvement, like that they're going to keep feeling better and better over the six months, as this, or if it's going to get better for a while and then plateau. So I'm not sure exactly what you're predicting, and I'm just using this as a really simple experiment or a description. But either way, we could have a non-equivalent control where let's say you're just going to get the measure up front. You're going to do it more often. You do it more often. But exactly when you measure this group, you'd measure this group. Same things, right? But this second group, this non-equivalent control, let's see. Let's make them blue. This is your non-equivalent control. Um, then you're going to just go ahead. There's nothing in particular going to happen to any of them, right? They're just going to pass time. And whenever you're scheduled to measure these guys, you're going to measure these guys again. 
So what good does this do us? How does this help us to say that if we get a significant result, that is the exercise that caused the outcome, the improvement in self esteem? How does this help to have this control group? And while you're thinking about this, I'm going to draw it again a little more neatly, okay? Give it some thought. Why would it help to have that control group? Now, this is a simple version, Gabe. I know you're going to measure more often and so forth, but let's just use this as a simple example. So here's a measurement period. Here's the intervention. And here's another measure. Okay. Now, we're going to have exactly the same thing in a condition two, a non-equivalent control. And we're going to measure, but there's going to be nothing, nothing in the middle here. And we're going to measure. And on the bottom here, I'm going to write down the critiques that we ourselves identified from the previous slide. We said, if there is an improvement in well-being, the exercise group, it could be due to, to weather, sun, semester. This is our critique of the one sample pre-post design. So to respond to this critique, we add a non-equivalent control. So now, how could you answer this critique if you have a non-equivalent control? Again, I'm not asking this question that well, even though I can see some of you will get it. So let me just do one more thing to clarify this. Let's imagine that we can see the results. Here are the results. Here we have well-being. I know that's not exactly what you're measuring. I keep saying that for some reason. So it's going to be here on this scale. Down here, we're going to have our condition. And let's just do the pre-post. And let's say that our pre-test level of well-being was up to here. So this is in our exercise condition. This is our pre-test. Before they did any exercise, then the exercise came in. And this is our post-test. They're feeling a lot better. So does this little display make sense? Kind of? It's OK. If it doesn't, then I should do better in explaining it. OK. So he measured well-being in all his people. And he found out that the average well-being was 5. Then he measured it again after all the exercise, and the well-being was 10. And he said, look at this, exercise works. Let's say that's how he decided to present his yeah. results. Okay. And then along comes the critique. That's Richard says, hey, look, you started your study in January and you ended it in May. How do you know that the exercise caused the improvement? What if it's just the sunshine that caused the improvement? And Gabe has to say, I have no way of knowing because I didn't include a control group. And then he has a big limitation to his study. Does this make sense? Seriously? So now let's add the control group. 
And here's the non-equivalent control, the same people, and he got their measure in January. So here's January. He measured their well-being. How good are you feeling in January? Both groups. And then in May, he measured their well-being again. But these guys had the exercise, and these guys didn't. Nothing special going on for these guys. Some of them might have exercised, but nothing systematic. Some of them might have gotten really slack and lazy. Nothing happened to them. And for their pretest, their also well-being was about five at the start. And at the end, it was yeah, just about the same. Okay, No change in well-being. This is before in January. And this is May. Now, Dave is making a claim that this suggests to us that exercise causes improvement in well-being. And Richard said, no, no, no. What if it's due to sunshine and not in any way due to the exercise? And now Gabriel can say, well, I had a control group. And we took their measures too, and there was no change in well-being. So it can't be due to the sunshine. If it was due to the sunshine, the control group would have improvements in well-being too. So now Gabriel can defend this position. So now tell me the ways in which I explain this that it doesn't make sense. <laughs> See if you can sometimes when it's really foggy, it's hard to even figure out what question you might ask. It makes a lot more sense now. It could just watch <laughs> I know videos are such a hard way to learn. I sit there and like, oh <laughs> I know. I had this class um, with this really amazing professor, John Allen. He's a super famous guy, an excellent speaker. And it was a class in psychophysiology that I really wanted to learn. It was at UA. And I came down, and it was supposed to be in person. And then he got some sort of a course release on a grant, and he wasn't teaching in person. And so he had all the recordings of his previous class very well done, professionally done. And I had to learn it that way. It was terrible. Oh, yeah, nothing wrong with your videos. I know. I'm, I was I'm not that kind of, like, it's in a way I'm not that kind of work. Yeah. <laughs> what are you, though? Doing it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what this is supposed to be about, but, yeah, I don't know. If you have any ideas on how to make it more accessible, I am very open-minded. What so, is this called again? This is, uh, well, what, this, this, what kind of design would this be? So let's figure it out. First off, you are going to compare your pre-post tools. So if you're comparing, like, Dustin's score, his well-being before the exercise, his well-being after the exercise, then we're comparing Dustin with Dustin. So that makes it a within-subjects design. So each person is comparing with themselves. Um, this would be called a repeated measures or you might say a pre-post design. But you would also have to add on with a non-equivalent, I'll, I'll remind you what that means in a minute, random, control. So what is non-equivalent? It means that you're comparing 30 minutes of exercise with nothing. They're not equal. 30 minutes of exercise is something. And nothing, well, people might just say, well, what if it's just that you're taking them for 30 minutes a day and, and organizing their life a little bit, putting a little structure in their life? They might argue that, all right? So it's, it's non-equivalent. It's a control that has nothing done. Random, because you're going to be randomly assigning people to each group, either that group or that group. And then this is, even makes it more confusing. You don't have to worry about this. But it would be 
of a thin subject between subjects, which yeah. makes it even more confusing. But that's what it would be. And because you're comparing data within each subject, but then you're comparing that change between two different groups who are randomly assigned. So those are some of the words that you would attach to this design. We would also want to add the word experimental because the random assignment makes it experimental. Now, if you don't, you are not even expected to have all these words. All you guys have to do is like, just wrap your head around this a little bit, right? Get the main idea, be able to offer some level of critique. And when you're seniors in college and grad students, all the farther along you go, the better and easier this gets. So don't get frustrated if you're bored with it right now, if you're not getting it all. You can get an A in this class for showing like that you're understanding the basics of these concepts end up writing in the APA style. Okay, let's do one more condition. Let's have a lot of participants and let's add an equivalent control. Let's say Gabe shared this design, he had these nice results, and now along comes me. And I say, Gabe, this looks great. I'm really glad that you got these results, but have you thought about this? What if the thing that made a difference wasn't the fact that they were exercising, but just the fact that at the same time each day they were doing something? You just added structure to their lives, and it's that little bit of structure that made them feel better. We all like structure. We all like to know what's happening when, right? What if it's that? So now, in advance of your study, I've concerned, you have a hard one, by the way, we can talk about yours. <laughs> I'm concerned about that, right? So now, what are you gonna do proactively to address that possibility? Well, let's think about it. What if you have a third group? You get the measure. And now instead of just nothing, let's do 30 minutes of something. Here's our 30 minutes of exercise. 30 minutes of something. We talk about what that is in a minute. And then let's measure again. Now you've just proactively addressed that criticism of what if it's just structure, 30 minutes of something done at the same time each day is good for people. So what could people do? What time of day are you going to have your people exercise, Gabe? Does it matter? I think you were just going to let them do it whenever they wanted to, right? Yeah. Okay. Are you going to ask them to do it at the same time each day, if they can, to the extent possible? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't call in the morning, but I think within their own schedule. Within their own schedule, but whatever their schedule is, do you want to, like, I always go on a sunset walk. That's my schedule. Like, do you want to have them choose a time each day and then stay with that time? Yeah, the morning or evening, I think it's the morning or evening. Okay. So whatever you decide to do, but let's say that they're gonna choose a time and stay with that time. Okay, so what could someone do for 30 minutes a day? The that, walking. Okay, so the walking is his control, his main experiment. He thinks walking is gonna help. So what could someone do instead of walking? Puzzles. Okay, so they do cognitive games. Same time each day, right? They could do like a crossword puzzle. By the way, I have a question for you, Gabe. What do you guys think? What if someone decides to just go for a walk on the treadmill in the gym? Is that going to be the same, or do you think they have to be out in nature somehow? Okay, so you're not positing anything about whether walking outside differs from walking on the treadmill. Yeah, I think there is a difference still, like walking outside versus the treadmill. So we could we could do this. We could say walking outside up here in your condition. And you could sign the other people to walk on the treadmill. 
that's a possibility. You could do a crossword or you could do something like treadmill versus outdoors. Anything else that people could do 30 minutes a day that might be like a control condition that they do at the same Cyber time? Ball. Okay. okay, they could do a competitive sport. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how they're going to find this competitive sport. You know, they could go gold. I don't know. Like, <laughs> what could they do? They could play a game of ping pong, you know? Pickleball. <laughs> Pickleball. Crochet, yeah. crochet for 30 minutes. Yeah, crochet. Yeah, they could crochet. Okay. <laughs> so they could. Uh, so this is where you're thinking about an equivalent control. And this is really the best of all. Because then you're ruling out many possibilities. You want it to be equivalent in terms of time. What does equivalent mean? It means that the same amount of time is dedicated. Time allocation. Maybe like the level, maybe like companionship. If they're to walk alone, you didn't address this by the way. Are they walking alone or with a companion? This would be like a solo thing. All right, it's solo. All right, so you have to make sure that it's also solo, whatever they're doing. So there's our, there goes our pickleball. <laughs> Because this has got to be something alone, so it's got to be solitary, okay? Depending on what you hypothesize, you know, if you hypothesize that it's nature, walking outside in nature, that makes a difference. Well, then we have something more complex going on, right? Because then you have to say, well, what if it's in the city, you know, and whatever your equivalent control is. It's, but this is the idea. This is why I've been pushing you to do an experiment, and not even a quasi-experiment. The place for quasi-experiments, you guys remember what an experiment has to have? I'm really ignoring my online people, I'm sorry. Dustin, do you remember what the two things an experiment has to have? Not at the top of my head right now. Um, we have to do something. We have to manipulate something. So you're manipulating what happens during those 30 minutes a day, right? So that's our manipulation. And then we have to control the extraneous variables. And that's what we're doing now. So all those things that we suggested, is it the sunshine? Is it just the routine? Is it the semester rhythm? Is it the being outdoors that's making a difference rather than the exercise? Could a person just sit outside in the sun and get the same benefit? You know, these are the extraneous variables. So when I say do an experiment, that's what we're looking for. If you can, you might not be able to, Richard. Let's see. But if you can, and the only, and in your example, you can, so you should. And in Dustin, in your example with the plants, you can, so you should. Right? There's nothing ethical going on. Now, if you were interested in whether smoking causes birth defects, could you do an experiment? Could you manipulate and randomly assign 30 women to smoke during their pregnancy and randomly assign 30 women to not smoke during their pregnancy and then see if their babies have birth defects? No. No. Ethical violation, you can't do it. You have to use a quasi-experiment. You have to let the women choose whether to smoke or not, right? Okay. What if you're interested in seeing whether males and females differ in the extent to which they get satisfaction watching a football game? Could you randomly assign half the people to be male and half to be female? You be male, you be female. Dustin, you be male. Justina, you be female. Could you do this? No. People either are male or female. You have to do a quasi-experiment. But if you don't have to, especially in our little fantasy dream world here, you do an experiment, right? Because if we were really sitting in the class and you were presenting your work, everyone in here would be asking the questions I just asked. Gabriel, couldn't this be due to just sunlight? Gabriel, couldn't it just being outside that's making a difference rather than the exercise? And this is where we go. This is our critical thinking. This is all the things that you guys want to think about. You're just starting to learn that right now. But that's what we're kind of working on here. Health issues with flu season. Thanks, Justina. Yeah, flu season could make a difference, right? This is the time when people get sick. 
So, in terms of the feedback I gave you on your papers, does this make more sense now? And do we want to go through anyone else's design in a similar way to get an example? Dustin, would you like to? And otherwise, we'll get to Richard's kind of, let's help Richard think through his problem after this, okay? We're all going to be critiques and think about his issue. Dustin, does this help you enough, or should we go through yours a little bit, too? Um, I got a better understanding of it. You know, like, like Gabriel said, just watching the videos is kind of hard to... But this, you know, makes a lot more sense about going upon the, the whole paper. Let's do it. Um, I'm going to clear off the screen. And you you just, if you don't mind, tell me a little bit. And then we'll come to yours, Richard. So we'll do everyone is here. And just enough. You're, if that's you here as DC student, we'll do it. So let's do another one. We'll do it a little quicker this time, okay? So what's your hypothesis? Let's start there. Try and make it really simple. Like, People with plants in their apartments. Let's start with that. And then you shake up the hypothesis. Okay? Okay. What would you say, Dustin? Uh, I, would, I would just say, like, does indoor plants help reduce stress levels? Okay. So we're going to say then people with plants will have lower, this all comes from stats class. And I don't think you took that up. Lower stress levels than people without plants, right? Does that kind of capture it? Yeah. I'll write the word indoor here too. We're talking about indoor house plants. Okay. And then um, what you were thinking of, tell me about the design that you were envisioning. And I'm going to draw it while you tell me about it. You had one sample, I think, right? In the original design? Um, yeah, it was just the plants. Okay. So were you going to do pre-post where you're going to measure? Yeah, I was going to do a pre and post test on uh, the participants using um, the uh, the swab, the, the, um, the cortisol or whatever. And oh, then yeah. the... Uh, the really nice dependent variables. What are your measures of stress? How you're going to operationalize it? Stress. You were going to, you said the swabs. Uh, blood, bl blood pressure. Okay, you were going to get blood pressure. I like these physiological measures. And then you were going to get, what were the swabs for? Uh, to measure the, I think it was the cortisol. Cortisol, the cortisol. With the swabs. And then you were also getting a self-report measure. I yeah, self-report. Self-report of stress, you had a validated measure, I think, right? Yeah. Okay. I just don't remember the name of it at the top of my head right now. Right. So we're expecting, what are you expecting that with the plants? Is blood pressure going to go up or down? Uh, if you have the plants, the blood pressure will go down. All right. Cortisol, up or down? Uh, down. Self-report of stress, up or down? Um, it should be down as well. All right, so that's sort of what you're looking for. It's nice. I like the way you operationalized your dependent variable. So we're going to get a measure of all three of these right here. Then you are going to give a house plant, right? Yeah. You're going to give a plant. And then you were going to measure again? Yeah, uh, the first week. Okay. So you were going to get several measures along the way, right? Yeah. Okay, so that's something that statistically we'd have to deal with conceptually, just keep it, but it's a little bit complicated measure, but it can definitely be done. So we'd have to be gathering, you'd be getting lots of different data points and we'd have to like um, average them out or get like some sort of numbers that we can work with, but don't worry about that. This is perfectly fine. For the sake of this example, I'm gonna lay it out this way, if that's okay. Just yeah. keep it simple. All right, so here's our intervention, our plan. Okay, let's critique. Let's say, is this a six month time frame, Dustin? Yeah, six months. All right, so here's January. Let's do it again here. January, and here is May. And let's imagine he gets this result. He's, let's say, measuring cortisol. I'm going to lay it out 
a little differently this time. This is the way you'd often display these kinds of repeated measures. Here's our pre-test measure of cortisol, let's say. That's a stress hormone. And let's say this is the, um, this is the cortisol level. And at the pre-test, the cortisol levels were way up here. And then whatever aggregate for the post-test, they were like way down here. And so that's what you got. Pre-test cortisol was much higher than the post-test. And Dustin says, yay, my hypothesis is right. And the Navajo Nation should invest in an indoor plant for every single resident because their stress will be reduced and that has health benefits. So now let's now you are the one who has to spend the money to buy all these house plants. So let's critique this design a little bit. Could anything else besides the plant explain systematically, not just individual differences, right? Someone had a, you know, they had a loss in the family or so, not just that, but like systematically affects these participants that could cause this change. From pre to post. Or could it be weather again? Again, we could have weather. Yeah, stress levels decrease. Semester, another critique. Mm -hmm. So we say to you, Dustin, how do you know it's not just the rhythm of the semester or changes in weather that cause this decrease in cortisol? Um, I, I don't know. I maybe the the amount of times a person takes care of the plant during the day, I mean, it's 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 more like you're 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 telling them to to water the plant at certain times, okay. so it becomes like ingrained in them. You know, I guess it like teaches them how to when the watering time is, and and during that time, it's it's also a time for them to care for the plant, so it gets them like uh, used to it. So what you're doing now is you're explaining why you have your hypothesis. And those are good reasons for why you form this hypothesis. What we're questioning here is now that you have your hypothetical results, how do you know that it's the plant that caused the difference? Are there some extraneous variables that could have caused the difference? And we already had some suggestions that the weather change during that time could have caused a difference. So let's put extraneous variables. So we know that the weather possibly, and we know that semester kind of changes for a lot of people can choose to make the difference. And you know, there may be other things, right? Or oh, type of plant, I guess. Too. Yeah, type of plant is something that he's going to have to control. Absolutely. So if he's giving different plants to everyone, well, maybe someone got a, uh, you know, Venus flytrap that <laughs> bites him all the time, and someone else got this beautiful philodendron, and you know, so the type of plant he'll have to control as well. Okay, but as far as this pre-post result, we have all kinds of other factors that could explain it. So what this is what we should do about it, and this is what I suggested to you. What what should we do about it? What should we do? I'm going to ask you to tell me. I'm not going to write one sample here. What are we going to do instead? We're going to have two or more samples. Okay, so we could have a non-equivalent control, which would just mean We measure, measure the cortisol and all these great dependent variables we identified. And we measure. And there's nothing in the middle here. It's empty. So you could do something like that, Dustin. And then you could say, when Richard poses this problem, you could say, well, look, my control group, we also measured cortisol, and there was no change. Let's imagine his control group had something like this. These were their cortisol levels before. 
and after, here's their cortisol level. And Richard and uh, Dustin can say no, because if this was due to the sunlight or the semester, then the control group would have a decrease in cortisol, but they don't. So now he has a difference. But now along comes me, and I'm gonna say, Dustin, how do you know if it's the plant that caused the difference? Because what if instead of it being a plant, it's like just the act of doing something each day, it's the routine. Or what if it's just the act of caring for a living thing that makes a difference? And Dustin has to say, I don't know. And this gets awkward. So instead, <laughs> let's have another group. Here's another sample. Or let's just, instead of this sample, let's replace it with this sample and let's do something like this. Measure. And let's have something equivalent going on in here. And let's measure again. Plus, there's a finding like an animal or something. Yeah, they could have an animal. Oh, that would be, yeah, probably be a violation of the animal. You know, we have all kinds of complications there, but theoretically, we could give an animal. And that would allow us to say both conditions, they're caring for a living, living thing. And now we can compare, is it the plant that makes a difference? Or I was wondering, Dustin, tell me about your original hypothesis. Like, do you think that part of what makes a difference is having a living life form in the house, especially for people who live alone? Could it be the life form that makes a difference? I, I would think so. I mean, that's kind of the reason why I kind of like asked the question. That's what I thought too. But now your critic is saying, well, maybe it's just that the plant looks pretty in the window and the aesthetic pleasure that they're getting from the plant is what's causing their stress levels to decrease, right? So then I said, let's try a fake plant. Mm -hmm. All right. But even with that, there's still a criticism remaining. Because remember, Dustin pointed out that this real plant is going to have to have a lot of care. This fake plant, no. Interesting. So maybe it's the care that's causing it and not the living plant in the home. We're getting rid of these extraneous variables. Or is it more like the visual one? Like just the visual one. Like just seeing something. <laughs> exactly. We're ruling out, is this a set? So now we've ruled that out because let's say the, the live plant looks just like the fake plant. Okay. The plant stand is the same. So now we aesthetically, visually, we're seeing the same thing. But we still have a difference of this care, caretaking. So is there anything that we could plug in here that would be analogous to care? That would be like something they have to do every day to the state plant? <laughs> Dustin, that's all I like. Wipe it down. <laughs> Dustin, your people in the control group are required to dust that darn plant every day. <laughs> and we'll be coming in with our white glove and yeah. testing for dust. Yeah. So you be careful. <laughs> but now, if this group comes up with something like this, here's their before stress levels. Oh, let's do it a little different here. Let's do it like this. Here's their before stress levels. And now having to dust it each day, look what happens now. They're really stressed out from all this dusting. Now we have something to show, right? Mm -hmm. Now we can show that it is the living plant in the house that's causing the difference. It's not having a little job to do every day. It's not the aesthetic, right? Now we've got something more to show. And these are the kind of results that we're looking for, okay? This is the kind of study that I'm striving to help you design. So on our paper, we have to have like a, a graph almost like this. Or yep, you're going to want to show your results. It can be really simple and you can draw it by, you should draw it by hand. It'll be too complicated to do it in a in an app. But yeah, you're going to have a diagram, something like this, except much neater and more clear in your final paper. All right, 
do you guys, I want to have time to go through Richard's idea. He's got a kind of a complex idea. Let's think of a way that we could do an experiment. So now we're going to put all our brains together on this, yeah. okay? Stress, stress me out. <laughs> no, yeah, um, Richard has a really important idea. Thinking about gambling addiction, right? Mm -hmm. And that being living close to a casino increases the risk of gambling addiction. Simple, simple idea. So maybe this won't be an experiment. Maybe we won't be thinking about an experiment. But let's just think about this at all. Let's write down the hypothesis and let's think about whether this could be an experiment. I'm going to start the way we do in stats class, your hypothesis. People who live near, this is kind of ambiguous, nearer to, that's right, people who live nearer to casinos have greater likelihood of gambling addiction. I'm going to get rid of this word likelihood. And by the way, Richard, you can take these notes and, and use them. I wouldn't consider that cheating. Greater rates of gambling addiction than whom? Can you finish the hypothesis? People who live near to casinos will have greater rates of gambling addiction than people who don't live close. Yes, than people who live far from. Um, One way we could approach this problem, just to be upfront, is we could just compare real people, right? We could ask people two questions. How near do you live to a casino? And then we could give them a scale to measure their addiction of gambling, right? That's one way we could do it. So we could measure survey using a good random selection process, making sure that you're not using a convenient sample, but you're using a good random selection process. And you could ask two questions. One, how near do you live? You know what I mean there, right? And mm -hmm. two, we would get this gambling addiction scale, which there is one. And then we could find something like this. We could find that miles from casino. We could put that on the x-axis. On the y-axis, we could put gambling addiction. And we could see if there's a correlation. And we would expect that the further away they live from a casino, would gambling addiction be higher or lower if they live farther away from the casino? It would, it would be what? It would be lower. It would be lower. And what if people live really near a casino? It should be real high. Real high. Yeah. And so if you gather data and you get something that looks like this, then you say this is a correlation. And you could conclude that there is a relationship between proximity to the casino and addiction to gambling. Now, does this mean that Living near a casino causes the gambling addiction. Or are there other possible... Well, I'll say, probably, it could be a factor, but it doesn't have to be the main one. Because I've seen people who live in Shimley that that you mile every day. <laughs> Is it possible that living near a casino causes addiction? Is that possible in a remote? Yeah. 
All right, so it could be that living near a casino X causes addiction. Is it also possible that being addicted to gambling causes people to move near a casino? Yeah. Okay, so that's also true, right? Is it possible that there's some other third variable that causes both people to live near casinos and causes them to be addicted? I can't think of any off the top of my head, but maybe you can. Employment. <laughs> like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, employment. Yeah, that's an but excellent one. If you work there, you can't play there. You know. Oh no, I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you can't. Uh, okay, so, so that's. that's a I really don't think. That. <laughs> Even if you work there, like on the ground or something. Yeah. Okay. So we'd have to think of some. Maybe that would be some. But do you see the the yeah. weakness of this design? You're trying to make the point that maybe gambling casinos should be located 100 miles from any homes or something like that, like which would be hard for the employees. But do you see the limitations of a correlation? Yeah. We don't know the relationship. So now, in our imaginary world, could we envision any sort of an experiment where we're taking people, adults, And we're randomly assigning them to one of two conditions. Can we imagine anything? I don't know, but maybe. We'll just think about it a minute. Maybe like an online casino game. Oh, well, that brings a whole different level of complexity, doesn't it? Online gambling? Because I thought about that too, and I was like, sports betting. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, but people that's... are doing that, so I think that's a big deal for people. But, but maybe that's, you can just say, if someone criticizes you with that, you can just say, that's outside the scope of this study. Then I was thinking, like, illegal gambling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hit on the red, but we know. <laughs> we can play cards with <laughs> I mean, that's a really good point, though, because you're saying that there's all kinds of ways to gamble outside of the casino, mm -hmm. right? But yet, our addiction rate's greater if there's a casino nearby, despite the presence of lots of opportunities to gamble. I mean, that strengthens your point, actually, that there's lots of ways to gamble. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think I was overthinking this whole thing, and it just... <laughs> right. It's, you it's, can just remember to keep your scope narrow. All your testing is, does living near a, a casino cause an increase in gambling addiction? Okay. Don't get tangled up beyond what See, that's where I thought I was supposed to go with it, was to take all these other variables, I guess. Yeah, it, it gets hard. Yeah, an experiment, you really can only test one thing. It's like a weak, it's like a, possibly even a criticism of an experimental design, but you can't test everything in one study. It's like... That's why qualitative research is so valuable because it can get at the nuance. In quantitative research, you're just looking at linear effects. And okay. so, yeah. I was looking at a, like a six month study, but. Okay. So we can't exactly tell people to move, right? Yeah. But we could theoretically set up little mini casinos nearby people or something like that. Like, do you think so? Mm -hmm. Some sort of a mini casino? Mobile casino. Mobile casino. Casino and wheels. So let's randomly choose. Maybe maybe we're not assigning adults, we're assigning maybe communities. Like you know how the chapters around here, they're like kind of clusters of homes. They're not very big, right? So maybe we use chapters as our units of analysis. Just thinking out loud. And we randomly assign, say, 10 chapters to have a mobile casino. To have gambling as usual, right? Just the normal things that they do, nothing unusual. <laughs> or alternately, that would be a non-equivalent design or we could have an equivalent design and we could give them like a gaming station that doesn't involve betting. Something like that. That might be even a better one, okay? So we're gonna put these mobile, in one place, we're gonna have a mobile casino for 10 of the chapters and 10 of them, we're just gonna have the same thing, looks just the same, but there's not gonna be any money involved, okay? 
and we're going to measure gambling addiction. All right, we're going to leave these there for six months. And at the end, we're going to measure gambling addiction in the individuals in each chapter. You know, it's just a way that you can think about it. It's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. It's experimental. It gets away from this criticism that maybe people who are addicted to gambling move to live near casinos, right? Mm -hmm. No one can criticize, critique that anymore because you've taken care of that. And let's just think for a minute about what our results would look like. Really simple results here. What would you predict? Let's put on our x-axis, these two conditions. So these are the casino chapters. And these are the non-betting chapters. And this is the average score on the gambling addiction scale. Which would you predict to be higher if we were going to draw, let's draw one bar, let's say the gambling addiction on these casino chapters is here. Do you expect the bar to be higher or lower for these non-betting chapters? Uh, lower. This is what you would do for your predicted results. You just draw something like this. You'd want to give it a title. You know, you would name it figure one. And then you'd have to give it a really clear title. You'd have to say, rates of gambling addiction. I'm just writing really quickly. <laughs> Between chapters with casinos and chapters with non-betting gaming stations on the non addiction, something like that. Let's say you want to give it a really clear title, but this is this is it. This would be your results section. It's really simple, you guys. All you have to do is draw a picture of what you would expect if your hypothesis is supported. Give it a nice clear title. So Questions so far, are all of you here feeling a little better about knowing what you're doing? No, I do. <laughs> I really, I really do that. Dustin? Yeah, I have a good idea. Uh, well, yeah. Okay, I want to make another point that I saw in a couple of your papers. There was some conclusion and inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria. So let me just clarify this real quickly. Exclusion. So inclusion is who you want to be in your study. So going back to Gabe's study, you were wanting people who were full-time students, mm -hmm. male, and you had no age limitations. You said age 18 to 60. So these are your inclusion criteria. No one can be in the study unless they meet these three. Did you also say residential full-time students? They have to live on campus? Yeah, those that reside on campus. Okay, residential full-time students. So if you're not a residential full-time student, you are not you can't participate. If you're not male, you can't participate. If you're not within these age ranges, you can't participate, right? That's inclusion criteria. So now exclusion criteria is, what if you meet all of these characteristics? Are there any way, are there any people that you would exclude even if they meet those characteristics? They're full-time residential students who are male within that age range. Would you exclude somebody? I think you pointed out health concerns, right? Mm -hmm. Someone with serious health concerns you're going to exclude. Are you including in this study um, sort of like transsexual people, or do you think that would confound or complicate the results? That's my 
Yeah. If they do identify as male, yeah. If they identify as male. So it's up to you. I mean, if you think it wouldn't really make any difference, if there's not any particular, if you don't have a reason for excluding people, you shouldn't. So if you really don't think it would matter, then you keep them there. Okay, if you think there's a possibility that the transsexual students would have a different result, would respond differently to this stimulus, to the exercise, than other people, then you exclude them. So, anyone else that you would think of excluding? So should I put those that identify as male or just? Male? You don't have to say anything. Okay. You can just say male because you're not gonna exclude anyone. It's up to them to determine if they're male. That's what you're saying, okay. Um, what about, would you want to include someone who already has a really intense exercise regimen? Because that would be messy because now you're taking, they have an intense regimen, maybe they tend to jog 15 miles a day and you're saying, oh, and I want you to walk 30 minutes a day. Huh. And they're like, what the, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So do you want to pick, only include people who have a limited exercise regimen? I mean, how do you want or to decide? Exclude. exclude people who have a certain, you know, you can define it either way. Okay. But maybe you'd have to ask a screening question, how much exercise do you currently do in a typical day? And then either, you know, you'd have to have a cutoff point maybe. Mm -hmm. Like for me, I walk a couple hours every day. So to tell me I have to walk 30 minutes a day, it would be like, well, you want me to add that on or what are we thinking? You know, it wouldn't make that much sense. So you're taking people who really are living a more sedentary life, I think, right? Does that sound like a different study now? I mean, it's worth thinking about this. Yeah. So you're going to consider how much exercise they currently get. And you're probably focusing on people who tend to be more sedentary, right? Okay. That's what I think you're probably doing. All right. So anyhow, that's the idea of inclusions and exclusions. You figure out who you want, who you're trying to generalize to. And then you figure out if someone met all those criteria, mm -hmm. on what grounds would I still say, no, you can't participate. Maybe sometimes people who don't speak the language can't really participate, right? Because maybe they just can't do the measures, or that, often those are kinds of exclusions that you see. All right. So I'm going to show you one more thing before we go there. I know we've, I know I've kept you here a long time. How about take another ten minutes for me to show you a little bit about what you have coming up in your results and discussion. Is that all right? Mm -hmm. Um, who's DC student, by the way? Me. Oh, that's good. Oh, so just just being a left side, I think. All right, so let me pull up the slide. So your last thing that you're doing for the paper is you're going to be writing your results in your discussion, okay? And your, yeah, results in discussion, that's what's coming up next week. And so I just wanted to, um, I showed you already what the results are, but I'll show you again real quickly here. Maybe I get it pulled up here. <clears throat> Just pausing. Oh. So when we come to watching people's presentations, this kind of critique that we're making up that we're doing, these are the questions you ask. And it's not criticism. It makes the study stronger because no one in here, myself included, can think of every possible problem in the study. So we need all these different minds in it. So in your results section, all you're doing is you're predicting your outcome of your study. There are a couple of ways you can do it. Hang on, I have to switch my display. Oh, it's amazing. I might not be able to figure out how to switch to this slide. It's on the wrong screen. So I'm just going to leave it alone. Um, so wh what you'd be thinking about is, um, what do you hypothesize? Like just what I drew here, like you would hypothesize clearly, Richard, that the people who live near a casino would have higher bar. So that's, that's it. And you can use a bar graph. 
which is when you're comparing two groups. That's what I showed you. A bar graph has the two bars that are separate. So this bar and this bar, okay. Or you could use it in into it. All you have to do is show what your results are in some nice systematic way. A line graph would look like this. So for instance, again, you might consider presenting your data like this, the same for you, Dustin. If you picture that this change in stress level or change in cortisol or change in motivation is going to be gradual across time, then you might predict something like this. You're gonna see this increase over the passage of time. So you need to think about what you're actually predicting. Are you predicting that the beginning and the end are gonna be really different or that there's gonna be a gradual change over time? So you can think about that. Sometimes you have two groups. So you can see here that in the case that you have the intervention, the exercise group in black and the no exercise group sort of in white circles here. And maybe this is what they look like. And maybe we're measuring stress levels, okay? So this is how you present your data. But more importantly, you're going to, you're going to need to give some really careful thought in your discussion section. Oh, I can't get this to show it. Um, don't worry about that. Okay, so this is what your discussion looks like. It's really specific. It's gonna be probably about four or five paragraphs long. And each paragraph is gonna have a purpose. So your first couple of paragraphs, you're just gonna repeat what you predicted for your study in words. In this study, we predicted that people who live near casinos would have higher levels of gambling addiction than people who didn't. And then you're gonna link it back to your hypothesis. Then you're gonna interpret it. You'll say something like, um, this, this study suggests, you know, through an experimental model that when the opportunity to gambling is placed very near to where people live, they tend to have greater levels of addiction and that gaming alone without gambling doesn't seem to be the contributing factor. So you'll interpret it a little bit. And then circular connections, what that means is you'll go back into your lit review and you'll try and find a study maybe that you can go back to. This echoes and extends what Jones and colleagues said. Okay, so that's what you'll try to do. And then your limitation section is probably the big point that I wanted to just talk to you about. So no study is perfect and there's flaws with every study. And so in your limitations, you're just trying to talk about proactively, you're imagining when I present this, what is Dr. Russ gonna say about this design? Or what is the IRB gonna critique about this design? And then you proactively wanna say like, this study was somewhat weaker because it included only males. You know, it's limited, it only included males. Um, and then you wanna say, why would that be a problem? This could be a problem because females also need to reduce stress, you know? And then, then you wanna to respond to it. However, we can only study one group at a time and you know, a future study might concentrate on females alone. In Dustin's study, one limitation to this design Maybe it would relate to the fact that you have a pretty homogeneous, heterogeneous sample. A lot of different people, some have kids, some are really busy taking care of pets and kids and others are like just single people, you know, that's a limitation. Why would that be a problem? Because people with higher demands, you know, on their lives would have naturally higher levels of stress. They might not be able to gain the benefits of this one plant. And then how are you gonna to respond to it? Which is an exercise in logic. And so you wanna find three limitations and just talk about them and they're short. You just have to write like, this could be two sentences, three sentences addressing this limitation. So you ask a question and answer yourself. Yeah, you say, this is a weakness of this study design. Okay. And you recognize it could be a problem because it might 
you know, it might lead to this false conclusion. And we try to do this in order to address that. That's what you're doing. You're defending in advance the design. Don't worry about that right now. Let me just see if I have anything more on limitations. I think I do have something more, but it's not here right now. So limitations might be related to like the way you designed your experiment or who you included in your experiment or like in Dustin's case, maybe some people aren't that good at taking care of plants and their plant dies, you know, <laughs> is that people, you know, some people didn't have basic knowledge of house plants, you know, so. So these are the kinds of things that you want to proactively address. You're going to try and find out. And that's it. All right. In your last paragraph, you're just going to write about, you know, just a couple sentences. What would be the implications if this result is true? Richard, if you did find results that you had put these gambling things in all these communities and non-betting gambling and the other ones, and you found out that the gambling addiction just soared, went really high, what would be the implications? What would you want government agencies to do? Yeah. Shut them down. Shut them down <laughs> or like locate them farther away or, you know, I mean, you'd want to maybe have them not located a certain number of miles from people's homes. You know? And then maybe the future research in your case would be how many miles is far enough? Yeah. You know? That's a good question. How many miles, if someone's addicted, how many miles? I thought, I, I thought of that same question one day. I'm like, how far is far enough? How far is far enough? All right, so the people who are addicted, they might travel a couple hours. I hear that people do that for alcohol. When they want to get off the rest, they drive a couple hours. But let's assume these are people who aren't addicted and you want to prevent them from becoming addicted. So they're not addicted. How far would they drive, you know, just to do something that might be entertaining? So that might be a future study that you would propose. You don't have to answer that question. The next researcher can answer that. Okay. And that's the conclusion. That's the end of your paper. And then you're going to put all these pieces together. So I gave you a bunch of feedback and you're going to address all the feedback. And you're going to put, there's next writing the title and abstract. I always save it for last. Because you know, when you're designing your study, you don't even know what it's going to be. So that you'll do. The abstract is just a short little piece. And then you have a template. Let me just see if I can put my hands on it easily here. I linked up the template online, but um, I have the template here for the title abstract and introduction. So you, you can follow the template. The reason it's beneficial is because it um, you can just copy and paste into it. It's like all formatted for you. So, see if I can get it to come up here. My computer seems a little slug, sludgy today. Hardest paper you'll ever have done. <laughs> and the most tedious, I know. But once you have this class out of your way, you're well on your way to, you know, getting back to the fun stuff that you like about psychology. <laughs> um, okay, so what this should be is, just see here over here. That's just the title and abstract. Let me just see if the other one will be. I have a full template for you, and it's nice because you can just copy and paste your information into it, and you don't have to worry about formatting. Here we go. So here's your results section. So look what this says, your text here. So this, you don't have to change at all. Then whatever you wrote and submitted for your results, you can just put it here. You don't have to change the formatting. You know how sometimes you have to indent you think? This is formatted just the way it should be. The way I did it is to go into this paragraph tab and then make sure that there's no spacing before and after paragraphs. I made sure that it was double spaced and I told them indent the first line. Now it's all set up. But you don't have to do that because I did it for you. 
then here's your title. You would leave that here, and then you'd write in your title of your graph. So in the case of the one for Richard, it would be gambling addiction rate. Very specific. I don't think it's actually all capitalized to make sure it's bad. Rates between chapters with a gambling mobile center and chapters with a non-gambling right in the Navajo Nation, it wouldn't be necessary, but a really specific chapter. And then you just put your figure here, that drawing that you did, you take a picture of it, you plug it in right there, it should be centered. This is centered. And then you have to continue on to write a sentence or two about your prediction. It's very short, you'll see in the description two sentences. If you have another figure, you know, you can put it here, otherwise you can just delete it. And then here's your discussion. You can see it's all set up for you to write about like what your study found your limitations, here you write about your first limitation, your second limitation, your third limitation, and then your closing paragraph, okay? And I put a couple examples of final paper that were A papers last term. Um, one of them is quite advanced, I think, you know, beyond what would be expected of you for an A paper. Um, you'll see it's quite long, but the other one is what I would look for for an A paper. So you'll see the one that's a little bit, if you look at both of them, one of them is a little shorter. I can't remember if it's student one or student two. And the shorter one is an example of an A paper that might be at the level I would look for from all of you. Okay. And A isn't necessary. You can shoot to just pass the class you know, on the other side. I'm going to stop the share and see if there's anything else here then. Justin, have we lost you entirely with all of our? <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> I'm, I'm cool. <laughs> oh, good. I like all of your studies. You have good ideas. Learning to do an experiment is cool. That's how you get funding. That's how you get. Nowadays with research, at least out there, if you have any kind of random control trial, that's great. And if you can do neuroimaging, that's great. And that's how you get funding money if you want to do research. But we don't have any MRI equipment, so we're stuck with experimental random control design. Well, I'm glad you came. Um, I'll tell you what, I'll, I can meet with you again next week, but I'll wait to see if you want to. I'm happy to meet. But if no one's going to come, then it's not I'm meeting alone is still too much for me. <laughs> yeah, no, it makes a good point. Yeah. I'm glad you could come this time. Yeah. A lot better about what you're, where you're going. Yeah, I was pretty confused. And just like... <laughs> do your grammar check too. Do all that grammar stuff. Make sure you turn in something that's appropriate for college students in terms of grammar, organization, paragraphs, and spelling, and all that sort of stuff. <coughs> okay. All right. Glad you were here. Let me know if you want to meet next week and I'll come on back in. We can look through some of your actual papers, whatever, whatever you need. My job is to support you. All right, thank you for going over that. Well, you made it clear for me, so. Thank you for being here. Bye-bye. Thank you, Sue.